You're listening to episode 25 of the Christian Woman Leadership Podcast. Here's a clip from today's conversation. When things demotivate you, you don't really wake up and be like, okay, I'm going to kill it today. You know, it's the opposite. It takes a long time to get the courage again to restart. So I want to keep my goals where I don't have to restart, where I just can, I can keep pushing. Welcome to the Christian Woman Leadership Podcast, where we hope to inspire you to embrace your God-given gifts, skills, and passions in order to lead with confidence. I'm your host, Esther Littlefield, and I'm joined by my co-host, Holly Kane. We interview amazing and inspiring Christian women in leadership, and we also discuss leadership as a Christian woman in our churches, our businesses, our workplaces, and our homes. We are so glad you're here with us. Now on to the episode. This time of year, you hear a lot about goals, how to set them, how to meet them, and how to measure them. But what if there were a better way to grow in your leadership and your business by doing less, not by adding more and more goals? What would it look like to remove what's hindering you so you can move the needle forward in your life and your work? In this episode, I talk with Barbara Canero about how to set goals from a mindset of doing less, not more. Barbara is a wife, a mom of three children, and an entrepreneur. You'll hear about Barbara's leadership journey, which includes an interesting experience when she was in her 20s working in Argentina, why Barbara feels that women's voices need to be heard within the church, and how she creates a manageable routine while running her business and loving her family. I especially love the tip that Barbara shares at the end of our conversation about how she managed her schedule when her husband was gone on a missions trip. I think you're going to love this conversation with Barbara, but first, let me tell you about our sponsor for today's show. Today's show is brought to you by Audible, and Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to estherlittlefield.com slash audible and browse the huge selection of audio programs. You can choose your title and start listening. I would love for you to check it out and let me know if you do. Now here's my conversation with Barbara about how to grow and reach your goals by doing less. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to this episode of the Christian Women Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Esther Littlefield, and today I am joined by Barbara. And Barbara, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Oh, it's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Yes. So Barbara and I have actually connected on Facebook, and this is the first time we have gotten to talk in person, but she has been doing some amazing stuff in the world of ministry and church life. And so I'm really excited to chat with you today, Barbara, and hear more about your leadership journey. So can you just start us off by telling us a little bit more about yourself? You got it. Uh, So I currently live in Annapolis, Maryland uh, with my husband and three kids. So that keeps us busy enough. Yes. (laughs) Uh, And uh, I was actually born in Brazil. So my family um, moved to Portugal when I was 10. So I was raised in Portugal and uh, that's where home is. If you were to ask me where home is, that's, that's where it is. And um, um, I've owned businesses since, I don't know, honestly, I feel like I've been working since fifth since the age of 15 trying to do things on my own and as an entrepreneur um since 2001 approximately so you can kind of calculate it from there yeah yeah awesome great great and so what is your current role what what are you doing currently for your for your work business whatever. Right. So right now there's two areas where I'm currently investing in. One of them is uh, we have an agency, a marketing agency uh, for churches. So we work with churches and Christian ministries. um, And uh, that would be maybe 60%, 70% of what I do. Mm -hmm. Uh, And over and over, I felt this, um, I don't know, just a need to uh, share my knowledge and everything that I know with churches. And so from there, I created a training program for church communication. Um, and that's what has been, it's almost like, you know, the new baby and you're excited about it. And that's, that's where I have a lot of my time yeah. being invested right now. And uh, that's definitely my happy place. So. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Awesome. That's great. So tell me a little bit about just your leadership journey and when you realized that you were a leader. 
Yeah. It's funny because when I, when I thought about that in, you know, just looking back in my life and you do this retrospective and, and just go back into, um, when was the first time that I felt like a leader? And honestly, it was when people started following <laughs> and they were just expecting, you know, it's almost like, okay, well, what do we do next? And they would turn to me to ask, what do we do next? And, and my reaction was simply say, well, we do this, you know, and we do that. And I didn't really realize that some people were simply um, ex- waiting or expecting somebody to take the lead and, 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 um, and just tell them what to do next. And, um, I've, I think I mentioned to you, I have many business in the past and started really young. Um, but, um, I think one memory that keeps coming back to my mind was, um, I used to own a, a dance Academy <laughs> Oh wow. back in, uh, yeah, well, in Argentina. So, um, we ended up with 40 people in that team between teachers and, uh, some, um, people that would spread the word about the Academy. And, uh, so, you know, a team of 40, when you're in your twenties, is, is, it was pretty, I, I never realized that everybody else wasn't doing it. <laughs> so it was very accidental to put yeah. it that way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's awesome. I love hearing the, I love hearing kind of how you got there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so are there any other life events that you can think of that contributed to you becoming a leader? Yeah. So uh, prior to having that uh, dance academy, I was, um, it was actually my second job. So I had one job right out, out of uh, college. Um, it was actually provided to me by the state of, in, in Portugal and uh, uh, where they pay for your salary and all that kind of stuff. So that was yeah. one job. It was great to have it. It was my first experience in the marketplace. Um, and then soon after that, I moved to, to uh, Argentina and that's where I got my second, you know, I guess real job. That was my first real job because nobody was giving it to me. I had to actually apply and, you know, and um, during that time period where I was working for this marketing agency, um, I was given the um, leadership of a, of a department that didn't exist yet. So they basically were trying to get it started and uh, I was the one hired to do it. Uh, and everything went really well until the day they said, um, we need to get a man above you. We need to hire somebody who is a man uh, because the department needs to be led by a man. And I was like, well, was there, is there anything that I'm not doing right? Like, is, is something missing? Am I messing it up? Like, what's going on? And they said, no, you're doing great. You're just not a man. Oh, my uh, goodness. And so that started a journey of simply you know, honestly, there was a, a lot of, I had a lot of questions and, um, I, I was angry. I'm not going to lie. I was angry because their decision to put someone above my department was simply because I was not a man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and, and they, and they did, uh, in fact, they moved, um, on with that, with that decision. So, um, having to accept the fact that I was leading, I was taking care of the, the department. I put it together. I was able to build it from the ground up and then, just wasn't enough because of something I couldn't change about myself. Right. Yeah. So uh, that led me into this journey of just, um, leading from my weaknesses. Uh, I now work with churches, so try to be a woman, <laughs> you know, teaching pastors and convincing pastors, there's a better way of doing things and showing them strategies and tactics. And, uh, it's, it's, it's challenging, right. uh, very rewarding at the same time, but challenging. Yeah. So. so tell us a little bit more about what you do with churches now. Mm-hmm. And yeah, let's start with that. Yeah. So um, my, uh, there's a lot of, you know, midnight thoughts that eventually became an idea. Mm-hmm. So for me, it was, it, it me, you know, up at night thinking there has to be a better way of doing these things. There has to be a better way of, of uh, planning things and uh, organizing the way the church is communicating, even understanding who we're talking to, because I feel like uh, there's a lot of disconnect between what the church is doing for people that are in the inside compared to reaching out to those that would never set foot on the, you know, yeah. the church. So um, I feel like it's really easy for us to follow you know, to fall for the bubble. Let's just bubble ourselves in this little corner here. It's comfortable. We all believe the same and we all want to do the same and we all look the same. Uh, And breaking out of that bubble can be very challenging. Uh, And it's, there's a lot of unknown. So my search has always been, how can I create a way that is intentional? How can I help churches be intentional with people, reach out to those that are out 
outside of the church in a way that is engaging, empathetic, you know, understanding, and then inviting them Mm -hmm. and vice versa and being in the, in the mess, if that makes sense. Yeah. So um, that led to question after question after question. And at the end of the day, what I realized is that the Bible gives us two things. You know, it gives us, God is a God of orders, a God of plan is a God of, a God of uh, structure. I mean, he gave Noah very specific details about how this thing should be. Uh, And then he's also the God of, you know, the spirit and the wind that blows and we don't know which direction it will go. Right. And the balance is always like, how could I, how can I have these two interacting at the same time? Um, And I feel like churches either fall for only spirit and no plan or only plan and no spirit. Mm -hmm. So I want to be that person that just helps you navigate this. And, you know, if you're, if you're planning too much and you're not allowing God to move, gosh, we just need to go back to praying, you know, <laughs> let's just yeah. go back to praying. <laughs> there is, there's a little bit in the Bible about the importance of prayer, right? right? <laughs> so pulling them more to outside of the, um, the uh, just execution and no, and no spirit. And then, the other part is also true. Sometimes we're so stuck in, oh, we're just going to wait until the Lord tells us what to do the day before Sunday. And what I normally tell people is he also talks six months before Sunday. So, you know, (laughs) the question is, are we listening six months prior? So can we, can we start asking him sooner for what do you want us to do? And I've seen church do this successfully where you see three churches, four churches in different areas kind of preaching of the same thing at the same time. And you wonder, oh, wait a minute. And then you go to this one conference and the conference has the same theme. And you're like, whoa, I, I, you know, I see God moving in this. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you get started doing this? Were you, were you Mm -hmm. working at your church or volunteering? Like, I'm just curious about the origin of how you started (laughs) doing what you're doing now. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So volunteering, uh, actually I volunteered at a church plant where before they even had services, uh, that was actually the church I was saved in. So I was saved at a church that was not yet a church, which okay. makes it pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, so they were still putting together their team. They were just giving out free water in Annapolis and, um, I got a bottle and I looked at their tag and I was like, who is this? I thought it was a dance club at first. <laughs> <laughs> You know, because, you know, like churches don't do this kind of stuff. And so I was very intrigued and soon enough was introduced to the gospel and a month later was baptized. So it was a very radical type conversion for me. And, um, and I just like, Hey, whatever you guys are doing, I want in. So what do you need help with? And because I was, I had my agency at that time, it was natural to help with graphics and, you know, website and things like that. So I started like, just doing the the work that they couldn't do or the work that I could do better and faster maybe. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it soon evolved into um, a lot of activities that had to do with communications, but there was no organization, mostly because again, this is a church plant. A lot of things they were just figuring out as they, as they were going. Um, And I kept saying to myself, it has to be a better way. It has to be. Why, why is it Saturday night? I'm waiting for what's coming for tomorrow. Like, how, how come we can't know this sooner? Um, so there was a mixture of passion. Like, I want to help them with this. I want to do this. And this is awesome. Right. But on the other hand, I had this, honestly, the frustration was mostly coming from my husband. Like, hey, it's Saturday night. You should not be seated at your computer around right now. So, you know, this duality of yes. how can I serve joyfully and plan, plan ahead. So that's how it started. Okay. That's amazing. All right. I love it. So you mentioned, you know, the challenge of, um, as, as a female working in the church world, what are some of the challenges and then what are some of the things that you've done that have been helpful in your role and coming into a church team? Mm. Okay. So challenges. Um, I feel like we're not heard. I, I really do. I feel like sometimes I will say something and it's like, ah, uh, okay. And then here comes someone else and says the same thing. And I was like, oh, we should totally do that. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I know. <laughs> I told you that. I've been telling you that for a while. So I don't feel like there's an immediate, you know, 
receptivity to, to just what what we say. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's it's a you know out of out of um, intentionally deciding we're not going to listen to women. That's not right. what I believe is behind it. It's just a matter of habit. So it's a habit that we're trying to break. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, I think the the biggest benefit though in what I've seen um, happen over and over is that. And I don't know if this happened to your family or not, but women are the one deciding is which church we'll go to. So if you're a pastor at a church, chances are it's the women around you, the, the women in your neighborhood that are making the decision of first, they're the ones Googling. They're the ones going through all of the websites. They're the ones checking the kids ministry. They're the ones even trying to check the kids in before they get there. Uh, they're the ones getting directions to the parking lot. And Obviously, the, the 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 husband will have a saying on it, yeah. but at the same time, there's I would say a big chunk of the decision making processes is through the women. So I can bring in perspective that they can't ever understand. So uh, in that, I believe that little by little, we have been able to see uh, pastors just pay attention, and not just pastors, like leaders in general, just pay attention and recognize. Okay, I may never understand how a woman will interact with a website or how, you know, what matters to her. And I'll be honest with you, you know, things that matter to me in a church are very different than the things that matter to my husband. I'm hoping the church can accommodate both of us and our kids, but (laughs) they're different, right? Like um, I know, for example, I want to go to a church that has a lot of things happening for women. I want to go to a church that has a lot of women to begin with. My husband wants to go in and out anonymously. He doesn't want to interact with people until he's like at an, you know, a higher level of right. going on for him. So he wants to go in and out anonymously. I want to go in and start to talk to all of these women. <laughs> So, you know what I'm saying? Like we have yes. different, different uh, needs and in, in interests. And so the pastor needs that perspective. They, the leaders of a church need to understand how women are interacting and making decisions. Because if the church doesn't kind of, it doesn't resonate with me, I'm going to advocate for something else at home and say, ah, I didn't quite like it. Let's try something else. Right. So there's a, a strong voice at home for that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So having your voice as part of the conversation, I think is what you're saying and having women be able to speak into how are we, how are we looking to reach our community? How are we looking to reach out to people who don't know Jesus yet? You know, it's so important to have that voice at the table. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So Barbara, I know you have this all other side uh, of your life with the business. I mean, we've been talking about that, but you know, as a business leader, a big thing that we have to do is learn how to set goals and accomplish goals and hit targets and things like that. So I would just love for you to share, uh, you know, as we're talking about goal setting during this time period, um, what are some of the ways that you have found to work in your own life and in your business for reaching goals that you're Mm -hmm. setting? Right. So, um, Goals are funny because we tend to be very ambitious with our goals. You know, we all want to lose 30 pounds in a month. <laughs> right. And, and be, because, you know, if, if you lose just five, it doesn't count. Like if you lose, <laughs> it doesn't count. Uh, you probably can't see just five pounds down, but you can definitely see 30 pounds down. So we tend to set our goals as these you know, huge mountains in front of us. And I'm not saying there's, there's anything wrong with ambitious goals. And I believe that God is always prompting me to think bigger and dream bigger because then I can get outside of my comfort zone and let him do it. Yeah. Um, but from a practical standpoint, if I keep getting my, giving myself these really big goals that I have to achieve on my own, and then there's disappointment there because I didn't get there chances are I'm going to be demotivated and chances are I'm going to, it's going to take me a lot longer to get back on like, Oh, okay. I need to get set to school again and try, try doing it again. Um, so, um, some of the things that I've learned and I I have to give props to John Acuff with his book, uh, finish, which was fundamental in my, um, understanding of, you know, what perfectionism does to you and setting really big goals that you can't accomplish. Um, one of the things he says is like, cut your goal in half. Okay. So instead of me saying, I want to lose 30 pounds, I can say, well, 15, okay, 15, 15. So what happens if I lose 17? Not only I get the boost for accomplishing the 15, but I get this extra, like, man, I went above and beyond. 
that's going to give me the energy to actually keep pushing because now I don't want to go, you know, I, I, I have the, I don't know, this Hulk power that comes out of yes. nowhere. <laughs> right? It's like the momentum has yeah. started. Yeah. <laughs> so now you feel like a superwoman. Uh, where the opposite is also true. When, when things demotivate you, you don't really wake up and be like, okay, I'm going to kill it today. You know, it's the opposite. It takes a long time to get the courage again to restart. So I want to keep my goals where I don't have to restart, where I just can, I can keep pushing. So um, I remember telling my husband, you know what? Everybody tells me I need to walk 10,000 steps a day. I'm going to walk 5,000 steps a day and I'm going to be happy about it. And I'm going to see how long I can keep this up. And guess what? In some point in time, I realized I was able to get 5,000 without much effort, which then gave me the, the push and the motivation to say, you know what? I feel like I'm ready now. Now I can start pushing it up yeah. to 7,500. And this is a, obviously I'm giving you examples of fitness and walking because that, <laughs> that seems to be the, the hardest one for me. But in my business, I have to apply the same way. So if I say, uh, you know, I want to work with 10 businesses in the next quarter, 10 new businesses in the next quarter, um, um, is that really achievable? Is this something that's just going to drain me or can I execute it in a way that will boost the, whatever the next stage is after that? So I try to keep them manageable. And uh, the second one is really accountability. Like who's asking you, are you doing this? Yes or no. Uh, my Fitbit keeps me accountable for the steps. So if it's getting to midnight and I'm like, oh, this thing is going to know that I didn't reach the, the whatever. Seven, <laughs> right. You know, and it's going to be recorded forever. I can't change it. Once it hits midnight, there's this extra pressure from the outside. It's not just my own mind because my mind was saying, ah, tomorrow, you know, so I need to have an external something, hopefully somebody. Mm -hmm. and, and let me tell you, spouses don't count because we, they will, they will, you know, we'll just create excuses. <laughs> oh, you know, the kid was sick, right? You know that, the, yeah. So we'll create excuses. But if there's someone else that you can say, you know what, I just want you to check in with me once a month. This is what I'm trying to achieve. I just want you to ask me, did you do it? Yes or no. And if we didn't do it, my next goal is to identify what was the challenge? What came in between me and this goal? Because if I dismiss that part, I'm basically just going to fall for the same mistake in the future. But if I say, okay, you know what? I think, you know, 10 new clients in a quarter might have been too much, or I just didn't dedicate enough time to it. I just kept, you know, days just went by and I didn't really put any effort into it. So I know what to correct. Yeah. 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 Right. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Great. So I think that another thing that happens with those of us who are, who are driven and multi-passionate, like we have a lot going on and you've got a lot <laughs> going on. You're running a business, you're volunteering at your church, you have three kids and a husband, right? Yeah. So one of the challenges is just juggling all of that and keeping mm -hmm. everything afloat, right? Mm -hmm. So can you share if you have any habits or routines that help you to manage at all those roles that you, that you're yeah. balancing in your life? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I've chased this idea of balance for so long, um, to a point where I start hating the word. <laughs> mm -hmm. like, okay. Everybody keeps saying you need to find balance and I, I'm now I'm starting to hate it. <laughs> like, and I don't need <laughs> You know, I don't use that word often like hate, but it, it became this like, oh, I know I need to find balance. I know, I know, I know. Um, and for me, the realization Esther was it's hard to balance because when you think balance, everything needs to be perfectly aligned. And it's hard to balance when life hits, when kids get sick, when another baby comes, when, you know, my husband is now on a mission strip for three months. So it was like, that's not a normal month for me. No, <laughs> you know, like I went from four hands to two and uh, injured my thumb in the process. So I'm like, okay, God, I'm going from four hands to one. That's just not funny. Um, anyway, so this to say, like, when I think balance, there's this expectation that everything needs to align perfectly. And I had to let go of that. I had to say, it's not going to be balanced. It's going to be manageable. It's going to yeah. be something that is not stressing me out. So if, if there's an area of my life, they're stressing me out. I need to 
correct that area. And that may represent sacrificing a little bit on the other ones. Um, as a, you know, entrepreneur, it's really easy for you to uh, just dedicate a lot of time to your business. Why? Because if I'm an entrepreneur, that means I'm going to work in something I love. And if I love it, it doesn't feel like work. So often, most of my time will go in that direction. And I don't even realize I was like, man, I've been working for 18 hours. And it's been awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. right. You know, but, but your kids see you working 18 hours. Yeah. That's the part they see. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if all they see is the back of my computer and the back of my phone, then that's not a good thing. Right. Um, and so for me, it has always been like, okay, am I being present in all areas? Am I being, uh, am I participating in all areas? And what I have found recently is that in big conviction for me from the Lord is just like, can we cut off the fat? Can we remove things from your business? They're not really moving the needle. They're just fluff and they're keeping you busy when you could be using that time over here. Um, and again, I'm still happy doing the other things that will move the needle financially, will continue to give me that satisfaction, you know, doing things that I love. But there's a lot of little things that just eat up time and I can't multiply my time. So I need to be wise with how I spend it. So I, I feel like what the Lord is telling me is just, be wise, just how you spend. Oh, let me give you something that I've been uh, implementing. You know how uh, Dave Ramsey talks about the debt snowball. Yes. So you basically start with a smaller amount of debt and you, you, uh, the, the, the credit card that has the smaller amount and you pay that one off and then you move on to the next. Well, that's counterintuitive because the world tells you go for the big one and go for the one with a higher interest rate. And, and he's saying, no, 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 start with a little one gain momentum, feel excited, check that one off and then move on to the next and then the next and then to the next and you create the snowball. So what he's doing with money, I've been trying to do with time. So I'm removing little tasks and say, okay, well, I don't need to, um, I don't know, send an email to my clients about this particular issue. I can actually automate this thing. So now I'm saving 30 minutes in a week. What, what am I going to do with those 30 minutes? So basically snowballing my time in a way that I can grab from here, apply it in other areas that needed the most without sacrificing the, the business. Yeah. So that's what I've been doing to kind of keep it manageable, not right. balanced. Not balanced. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I always hesitate to use that word too, because I, yeah. I totally get what you're saying. It's, I don't believe that, that we can that we're going to be at perfect equilibrium in all areas of our life. Like that's not realistic, but yeah. I think like you said that you want to be able to be present with mm -hmm. your family. Right. And you want, but you also love your business and you love what you do. And I think that's something that a lot of our listeners deal with is that they love yeah. what they do, whether it's work, business, church life, you know, yeah. and it's, it can be easy to let that take over your whole life if you're not careful. So. Yeah. I love the idea of the time snowball. I'm going to have to <laughs> think about that because I think a lot of times we spend our time on things that aren't, like you said, mm -hmm. they aren't really moving the needle forward or they aren't essential or we're doing them five times during the day when we should just do it once a day, right? Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> save some time that way. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. So if you could think about what advice you would want to share with a younger leader, maybe mm -hmm. someone who's just starting out in ministry or in their career, what would you tell her? Yeah, I would say find a mentor, find someone that is willing to let you sit on their shoulders uh, and just observe, ask questions. Um, you know, and I'm not saying a coach. I feel like a coach is that person that will cheer you from the outside a mentor is someone that is in the trenches. He's like, yeah. that person is doing it, what you want to do. And they're just taking you along and um, just being able to pop the hood together and like, okay, let me, let me see how you do it. They don't have to teach you. They don't have to train you as much as it is just taking you in that journey. Um, I have found a lot of value from mentors. Um, honestly, I never saw the need. Uh, I've been, I'd been sitting in my little, like, I'm just going to figure things out on my own but the trial and error is, you know, very expensive time-wise, yes. money-wise, resources, stress. Uh, and some things are just not worth it to try and, you know, 
cross your fingers hoping that things will go well. So um, especially in ministry, I mean, there, there are lives at stake. So if I can sit in the shoulders of somebody and be able to ask them questions, hey, you know, what do you do when you face this situation? Or have you ever experienced this thing? And and just uh, get information that is from the field, not from a book or a, you know, YouTube video. Yeah. Or, it's like somebody that is with their hands dirty. Uh, that's going to really um, increase the way that you can become a leader faster. And let's just look at scripture. You know, that's what discipleship is all about is we always have a Timothy. We always have a Paul. So who's ahead of me? Who's behind me? Am I learning from somebody? Am I teaching it to somebody? Um, and creating this passing the baton approach to things is, in my opinion, you know, it cannot be um, underestimated. Yeah. So yeah. find a mentor. Yeah. <laughs> I love that you shared that. And there's actually an episode um, with Lisa Pulliam all about mentoring. So I'll put nice. the link in the show notes for that. And she used that same analogy of passing the baton. So that's, mm. that's cool that you mentioned that. So what about you? Who has been a mentor to you and yeah. how have they impacted you? So, um, I have mentors in my business, you know, yeah. group career side of life that have been uh, very influential. Um, my, the main person that I can name to you is Brent Weaver. He has been, um, not just an encourager, but someone that has seen in me things that I wasn't able to see. And he has been that person for me. It's like, he allowed me to sit on his shoulder and just learn, uh, absorb, see it being done. And, um, without expecting anything in return, you know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, so for me, that has been, um, it, there was a huge shift in my career when I was able to, to have uh, him as a mentor. And there were moments in time where I remember saying, you know, I need to find another niche. I have my, I have my passion niche was the church. Now I need to find my money-making niche. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he looked at me and he said, what makes you think that people in the church wouldn't pay for the services that you can, like for the things that you know and what you do? I was like, I don't know. They just don't have the money. I was like, if you ever show them the value, if you ever show them the value, Barbara, and I was like, I don't know. How do you do that? So, you know, questions that were so, um, I've never asked myself. So he was able to say, you know what, it, it, you know, stop talking to people from the what that you do. Like I do websites or I do blank and start talking to them about the why you do them and see what happens. Mm. And that changed everything for me. So to the point where I'm, it's, it's, it's rare for me to feel like I'm even selling because I feel like the conversations I have with people that work with me are more based on, you know, helping first. Like, how can I help you? What is it that I have that can change things for you radically or, you know, reduce the amount of time it would take you to figure something out. And at the end of the day, there's a, there may be a money exchange or not, but the relationship is based on helping first and not selling first. Yeah. You know? so. Yeah. I love that. So mm -hmm. important. And I think that you, like you said, that just having that mentor to, to give you insight that you didn't have in and of yourself yeah, is valuable beyond words. So awesome. Yeah. And courage and confidence. I feel like by ourselves, our minds would take us to a place of seeing all of our weaknesses and living off, you know, like feeding our fears and somebody from the outside has the ability to see it differently. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're stuck in this bottle and we're inside the bottle trying to read our own little label. And it's so much harder than if somebody comes out and say, let's look, this is what I see when I see you. Mm -hmm. And that can give you that extra confidence that you need to just take the world, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And going back to what we were talking about before with goal setting, having mm -hmm. a mentor to help you with that is, yes. is helpful as well, because they're going to do the same thing with your goals is they're going to challenge you on whether or not that's a realistic goal or whether maybe you're setting your goal too low because you don't see in yourself what, what they yeah. see. So that can be helpful there too. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Awesome. So Barbara, I'd love to hear a little bit about your passions because I find most of the women that listen and that I talk to, you know, tend to have multiple passions. They, mm -hmm. they like doing a lot of different things. So can you tell us just a little bit about your passions and maybe how you like to spend your free time if you have any? Yeah, right. That's the question of 
<laughs> year. Like, what do I do with that free time? Well, first I need to find it. Uh, because with three kids it's quite it's quite hard. So I used to I used to paint a lot. I've always been surrounded by artistic stuff. So I think that even taking the route of being an agency owner has, you know, came from a place of wanting to be artistic somehow. Uh, dance has always been a passion as well. Uh, but those can, have kind of taken a back seat for a while. Uh, so my artistic expressions nowadays are more, again, in, in stuff that we design for our clients and, and hosting. I love hosting. Like I could host people in my house every single day. My husband would not let me do it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I would do that every single day. And, and I'm, you know, like Pinterest fanatic. Uh, I just love looking for ideas and then implementing them, fail some of them and then, you know, perfect them. So I just love hosting people and okay. cooking and things like that. That's, that's where I'm, I'm, I'm a very happy person in that. Um, even, even more than, you know, people tell you like, go to the beach and read a book. I was like, that's just too boring for me. Like you put me in, just bring me 40 people to my home and I'm happy. <laughs> so, that's that's yeah. amazing. Cause that's, yeah. I'm the opposite. I'm like, <laughs> I'm such an introvert that, that hosting and having tons of people. Yeah. In the house, I like it. I enjoy it, but it's exhausting for me. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So that kind of reminds me though, just a lot of times I like to ask about just how you manage taking care of yourself um, we mm -hmm. talked about, you know, the managing your roles, but what about just staying healthy as a leader? Because mm -hmm. as a leader, we we're dealing with so many other people. We're dealing with our team. We're dealing mm -hmm. with our family. How do you take care of yourself and make mm -hmm. sure that you stay healthy? I don't, I'll be honest with you. I feel like that is the hardest area of my life. Mm -hmm. Um, because you know, uh, when, when, when life happens, when things happen, we, we lost our, our main nanny in May and, you know, two kids that would be out of school, a baby and, uh, my business is still running. Um, and overnight I lost the person that would take care mm. of her. Mm. And it was, it was very, very dramatic, yeah. uh, at my house for a little while. Um, but everything needs to keep going. You don't stop being a mom because yeah. your nanny can't no longer come and you don't stop being a business owner because you don't have a nanny anymore. So those two things have to be pushed forward. And so what you let go of, you let go of prepping meals, you let go of sleep, you let go of exercise and you let go of the things that are in fact, most likely the most important is because those are, that's needed to have everything else function. But it's normally the first thing we let go of. I know for that's me, that's true. true. And uh, so how, how do I do that? I honestly need outside help. I need friends that remind me of the importance of it. Even conferences that I attend, I'm seeing more and more how you have this component of, of complete health and there are doctors speaking at conferences for business owners. And uh, so um, support groups are great. Um, I have a small support group from within my business group that all we talk about is health. Mm. Um, trying to keep people accountable to just having you know, hours of sleep. And I'll be honest with you, uh, in my business goals for last year, when they asked me, what is it that you're going to do this week to improve your business? I said, I promise I will sleep six hours a day. And that's it. like, that's my problem. That's what I need to do for my business to succeed mm -hmm. is to actually sleep. Yeah. So that was my accountability for last week, believe it or not. I, yeah. I, I love that. And I just thank you for being honest because I think a lot of times, you know, people look at leaders and they think, oh, okay, <laughs> she has it all together, right? She's got all her, together. her self-care <laughs> routine down. She's getting up two hours early before the kids are up. She's reading her Bible for four <laughs> hours. She's doing, you know, <laughs> all those things. And, and that's a lot of times just not reality. Yeah, um, but like you said, sometimes it's just, okay. I need some outside help with this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you point, I think there's two things you said there. One is that you have a nanny or that you had a nanny. Did you mm -hmm. find somebody to replace her? We do, oh yes. But it wasn't until September. So we had three months in the summer with no help. So, yeah. so some women that are listening might think they, could, they, they never could have a nanny. And then others, others, that's part of their life. And I think that realizing what you need to yeah. keep everything running and not to have guilt about it one way or another yeah. is important. And then the outside perspective of, okay, 
whoever your support circle is, this is what I need to do this week. And, and we do that in my business team. We yeah. talk about self-care as part mm-hmm. of our business team meetings. And we say, yeah. okay, what are you going to do this week to take care of yourself? Because I find just like you, it's the first thing to go. Oh yeah. So. And a week goes by really fast before you realize I had two showers this week. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. But, uh, I'll share with you something that I did recently. Um, and again, it comes from a place of recognizing, you know, I can't do it all. Um, I told you my husband is out of town for three weeks for a mission trip. So we were able to somehow prepare for it. But I got to this point where um, it's still too much with three kids, a full time business. And uh, I mentor, I lead a Bible study. So there's all sorts of things happening. And, and somebody uh, asked me, hey, you guys want to come up? Come, just come for dinner today. And I said, yeah, I love that. Let's do that. I have to do dishes. <laughs> yeah, we're totally showing up to your house. But hey, I need to leave by seven. Like literally, I'm going to be there for an hour. We're going to eat and go because of the baby's bedtime. Yeah. Um, and they're like, oh, that's totally fine. We went, had a meal, left, had a nice little chat, pray together. And I came back home, no dishes to do. Yeah. My day is over. I said, it was amazing. Mm-hmm. So I actually reached out to all of my friends in Annapolis and I posted in my Facebook group and I said, hey, husband is out of town. Who wants to feed us? I would like to meet with a family every, every single day. We'll go to a house. So just feed us. We'll be there for an hour. We'll sit at the table with you. You know, we won't bug you. It's not going to be like a five hour, you know, we're just going to sit down. When you eat, we'll sit down and eat with you. We'll chat, catch up. And then we'll leave. And I got people to feed us every single day until my husband comes back. Oh my goodness. That's Uh, amazing. (laughs) People that we haven't seen in forever. So, you know, it's amazing how God worked, worked it out where he's helping me out because I'm not, you know, we don't have to worry about dinner every day. We don't have to do dishes at night every day. And I'm reconnecting with people I hadn't seen in a while. I'm connecting with families that are in my community. They are not in my church. Uh, so it's, it's, it was, it was a huge blessing just to say, you know what? I don't have it all together. I need help. And I could really use somebody feeding us right now. Yes. <laughs> so. It takes, it takes humility to ask for help, <laughs> but that is, that is so amazing because you are probably, you're, you're being blessed by it, but they're probably being blessed too, because they're I getting that so opportunity to connect with you. Like you said, if you haven't connected in a long time, I just love that idea. So, yeah. <laughs> <Worked> well. <laughs> so, so often I hear women talk about, you know, being in a difficult situation like you, their, their husband might travel or, um, you know, their kids are crazy and, but we don't ask for help. And then mm-hmm. we get bad that no one is offering help, but yeah. we haven't actually said I need help. So there's, yeah. there's powerful things that happen when you actually say, Hey, I could use some help right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> <Awesome>. true. <laughs> All right, Barbara. So uh, we're going to wrap up here, but I want to end by asking you um, to share with us something that you're learning right now. We always have our guests share, you know, something that they're learning that God is teaching them or a favorite podcast or a book you're reading, anything mm-hmm. that you think would, um, would benefit our audience. Yeah. So I just finished with the book finished, like I said, about a month or so ago, highly recommend it. If you are a perfectionist and a procrastinator, that's like, it took me a while to finish it because again, I'm a procrastinator, <laughs> but it was kind of ironic that it took me so long. But, uh, uh funny enough, uh, I, I, I started reading it in the actual book and then, um, I got the audio and I really liked the audio because it's him just talking and he has a very funny way of, of, um, of, of teaching and speaking. So uh, that book was very fundamental to setting the right goals and really executing on them. Because again, it's not the setting the goals, it's the implementation part that sometimes gets us stuck. Yes. Um, but one thing that I've been learning a whole lot, and God, don't we see this in the Bible over and over, is really what does my idea of growth look like? What does it look like to grow and scale and expand? And we tend to think it has to mean bigger numbers, you know, like more employees or more projects or more money or more whatever. And I feel like the Lord is showing me the opposite. Like you can grow by actually removing all of this extra stuff that is not really doing anything for you. I I call it cutting the fat. We're going to cut the fat. So we're going to cut the fat in my business, 
remove services that we're just doing for the sake of doing. Um, and I feel like I'm scaling, even though it feels like I'm reducing stuff, you know? So in this simplification process that we're going through, we became more profitable. Mm. So it's like, whoa, that's amazing. Like, how did that happen? You know? So, you know, our view of growth is so, and we have a kingdom view of it. We have to have a kingdom view of, yeah. of what growth looks like. And not always it's going to mean more money and more whatever. Yeah. And when churches multiply, they decrease in number, right? So if a church is sending people out, they should be decre- decreasing in number. Yeah. That's a good and that's point. how I see it. <laughs> so who am I multiplying? You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think that principle goes, it just can be applied in so many ways. And and a lot of times, and I struggle with this too. I I think it's a um, a phenomenon that's happening in a lot of, for women especially, feeling like we have to do all the things. Mm. We have to be doing everything. And the more things we do, the more productive or spiritual or or growth we're going to have, right? Mm. But like you said, a lot of times it's actually doing less, but doing it more effectively. Yes. where we see the growth. <laughs> yeah. That's so, where I'm going. So I'm yeah. hoping that I'll be able to report back a year from now and yeah. say, <laughs> I would love to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. All right, Barbara. So let us know where can people connect with you? Mm-hmm. Is there anything on your website or, you know, just anything that you want to mention that might help uh, those listening today? Yes. So um, I love talking to people that are either entrepreneurs or business owners. Uh, So if you feel like you're stuck and you can't really figure out what's that next step, um, I'd love to talk to you. So you can get a free consultation through my website. It's wordrevolution.com. So not world, but word, W-O-R-D, revolution.com. And um, if you're somehow connected to a church, uh, we do church uh, communication training as well. And that's through 412lab.com. But again, you're always free to reach out to me through Facebook. That's where I spend um, a lot of my time. So uh, you'll always find me on Messenger if you just want to chat and exchange some ideas and and that's it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. We'll put the links to all those in the show notes as well. So people can yeah. click right through and connect with you. So thank you again, Barbara, for taking t- the time today to chat with me. And I know that everyone's hopefully gotten some great tips from you and uh, hearing your story. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on the Christian Woman Leadership Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, would you consider leaving us a rating and review in your podcast app? This helps more women just like you find the podcast and it also helps them to know whether the podcast would be a good fit for them. Just go to the show in your podcast app, then scroll down until you see the option for ratings and reviews. From there, you can tap to rate and write a review. It means the world to us when you take a couple minutes to do this. And thank you so much to everyone who has left a review. Now, don't forget, Your leadership matters, and it's time for you to embrace your gifts and lead with confidence.